Ramat Sharon, Israel. A statue resides in a public park. A young child stares down at his brother. An engraving beside them reads, Your lives avenged their deaths. The statue is there to honor the 1.5 million children whose lives were taken in the Holocaust. In November 2022, a group of 33 like-minded international students embarked on a journey to understand the horror faced by those children and millions of others. We gathered on the Reichman University campus and shared our unique perspectives, hopes, fears, and expectations for the trip. I love history. I am Jewish, so I have a very important connection to this part of history which I also think it's important like for non-Jewish, but for me personally more. But I have this thing for learning and asking and curiosity that calls me for more. And I think that's why I'm here. So it's a very important aspect of my family's history, of course. And it's a part that, from my family's perspective, has almost been untold or just unknown because a lot of the stories of our family leaving Poland before the war were never spoken about. So it's where my grandfather was born, it's where he grew up for the first few years of his life, and it was very much part of who he was. He was a Polish citizen, but it was never spoken about, and now I'm going back to connect with that aspect of our history. My grandfather was a survivor um, from Romania. He always wanted to take me to Israel. Like he He said, Eli, when you turn nine, when you turn nine, I'm gonna take you to Israel. And he actually got uh, diagnosed with cancer, so he was battling that for years, and he actually never got the chance to take me. I think the first step of of honoring his legacy was actually coming to Israel. And I think the next part of fulfilling my legacy and and honoring him and, you know, and and making him proud and my grandmother proud um, is going to Poland, going to see what happened there, the remains of what happened. We began our journey in Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust Museum. And soon we were ready to embark on a plane and go firsthand to face the pure human evil our people endured. the Warsaw Cemetery. Uh, we're looking at all the grave sites and graveyards, I think that, not graveyards, grave sites and tombstones from before the war. So to show us that life existed and was respected like after life ended before the war. But after obviously there were no places respecting and marking the life of those that had passed. So to kind of show how big the Jewish community here really was and how present it was. I'm very impressed with the way they design these monuments and these um, tombstones. I feel like all the other tombstones I've seen in America are just very plain, but this, these tombstones tell a story. One of the things I told you was never take anything for granted. Never just accept what we're showing you, what we're giving you. And then we went to Yad Vashem, and I told you in Yad Vashem that we cannot speak about what happened here and about the death if we're not speaking about the life first. Each person that is buried here had a whole life before. Each has a story. I usually, when I go to see uh, graveyards, uh, cemeteries, I look at the names, I try to see the, the years they were born and they died and to understand what period of their life they spent. The living or the dead have something to tell us. So in my opinion, this is more stories than death here. It's 
large, it's big. You can actually see the big community that used to live here. I don't know, I guess the feeling of the history here. Um, it's very beautiful in a, in a sort of like quiet way. I do believe with all my heart in the natural goodness of man. Despite the blood and destruction, in the goodness of man I do believe. I do believe with all my heart that God gave man the blessing and the curse. Man can select the curse of envy, hatred and prejudices or the blessing of love, harmony and beauty. Despite the painful memories from the past, in the joyful celebration of life, I do believe. רק אלוהים שומע, הגב עולה מתוך הנשם. What's most for make me, I don't know, terrified, it's the, the silence here. This is, if, if to put a finger on what give all my attention, it's the quiet, it's how many graves there here, and how much the big community were here before the war. At like the mass grave we went to today, like when you showed us the picture and like you could see the tombs and like you could see like it's like real, like it's not like a scene from a movie, it's not just something that like people are talking about like you can literally look at the picture and then like look like straight ahead and like the tomb is there and like there are literally bodies under you and like it's such an insane concept to grasp but it's not like someone talking about a story like I know it's all important but like story is a story to me but like seeing that and like seeing like wow that's there and like I'm here and like it's just like so surreal to me that I'm in Poland and like this happened and yeah. I love being Jewish. I'm like I'm sick over how much I love being Jewish. I'm lucky, you know, like I'm, I'm in Israel, like I live in Israel, like I'm free to be Jewish, like that's, that's crazy, you know, like many people didn't have that. It's very weird because like in the cemetery, I didn't feel bad because I, I felt life, I didn't feel death, I felt like the history of the Jewish community here, how they were like great rabbis and great people. I think that like being Jewish is the best thing that you can ever be in the whole world. There's such an understanding and a community and a humility and a duty, like a sense of tradition and purpose and duty, that's what we're all doing here. And when people disrespect that and when anti-Semites like disrespect that, that makes me angry. Whether you've been Jewish your whole life, whether you don't have a Jewish mom but you've been practicing your whole life, whether you just found out that you're Jewish, you aren't religious, you are religious, you're automatically in. You're always in the community. But these anti-Semites, they will never know. And they'll never know the light that that brings to your life. It looks old, like it looks 1940s, which I don't know how to feel about that. It was shocking how, how tiny the environment was and how many people actually lived in these conditions, as well as just the state of these conditions was horrible. I'm very happy to see a lot of um, synagogues in the Jewish community here. It's surprising that there's so few people, but so many Jewish restaurants. It's very happy to see that after everything we know that happened here. And yeah, it's like impressive like to see like Hebrew like and places like this uh, when we know what happened. It's just weird to see how small it is and kind of um, compared to what we know usually to be synagogues and how big they are and how much life is in a synagogue and there's like a whole community and just seeing two people 
in there was kind of a weird experience. At the most difficult times in life, we latch onto names. In the Holocaust, when people had nothing, no clothes, no personal items, no food, no hope, all they had were their names. And even their names, the Nazis tried to take from them. But we'll never forget their names. So for every ceremony, we also take some flowers to a place where we do the ceremony and we leave them there as a little sign. You can see it, it says that it comes from us. And yeah, we light a candle, we sing, we have some text, and we leave the flowers. I tried to think of the people who provided me with a hiding place and shelter. I tried to imagine and I listened to myself and I asked to myself, had I been in their place, what would I have done? Would I, in the midst of an ocean of hatred against a world collapsing in flames, would I have been prepared to offer shelter to the son of a people other than my own? that the letter B is upside down. And that's the first time I'm mentioning the word resistance, saying it's not, it's false, it will not liberate you. The work will not liberate you. We saw all these kids who couldn't have been older than five years old walking into the museum. And it just hit me really hard because I have a nephew who's around, and he's also five. And I would never be able to even explain to him something so hard. And seeing these little kids with their parents just walking in hit me so hard. Are they even really explaining anything to them or are they just taking them to a museum? Then with the children's exhibit today, I thought it was beautifully done. It was also lower than eye level, like almost at a kid's eye level. And there's something I really appreciate about the artistic quality that's brought into it, because I think it lets you, like, it draws you in with the appeal and the beauty of it, and then it opens you up to like this layer of vulnerability.
Um, until a month ago, I'd never met another Adler that's not one of my close relatives. Um, and to see the books that Yad Vashem had made, the countless pages of Adlers, my Hebrew name Shmuel, seeing the amount of Shmuel Adlers on the pages was um, kind of scary to see because you never met another Adler. My grandma sent me this email of a couple of her grandparents and their family, who she's been looking for since um, 2006. I think she sent an email to Yad Vashem and they haven't been found since. I guess seeing those names on that email that my grandma sent me and then again right in front of me, like everything that in uh, my family I'd heard about, I am now like staring in the face and becoming a part of something, something bigger. I had a really hard time finding the name. I was like so anxious to try to find it. And when I finally got there, I, like, all the wrong words and like all the different ways of spelling it, but I also found a few wrong words. And like, I felt that's like a, it's not a, it's like a weight that you carry. Like my grand, my grandmother's name was also Esther. But like, it, it just feels like so much more powerful. When we got inside the bunkers, we smelled the smells and it smelled terrible. Then I understand that there were like thousands of people inside and they didn't have any toilets and stuff. So I understand that it was way worse than what I smell. Imagining that could be, could be my mom in there, and my grandma, my aunt, or my best friend, or me, and I just like really sank deep. And then Ellie said a story about her aunt, and that, and like that really like, pierced deep because it felt much more personal. It was important for me to say her name. I'm glad I did. Thank you for everyone for letting me tell it. Thank you to Shiri who asked me to tell it. I don't even know how to comprehend or express how that feels like I just don't understand how they did it like all the only question that keeps running through my mind is like you don't think I would have been so strong like there's no way that I I don't even know what I could hold on to at that point like every single day like the simplest thing is like walking is so hard it just it blew my mind It's quite sickening to start with. Like, there are no words. There's just nothing to describe. No words can describe one how impactful it is, but also how sick. It's how sick it is. Nothing matters. The what you have, like what your house looks like, anything in life. Just loving each other and having a love for humanity unconditionally. really asking myself, 
Can I really tell what happened here? Can anyone tell what happened here? I can't. Probably no one can. Because when I will tell you that they were hungry, they were starving. Everything they thought about is food. Is it enough? When I will tell you they were afraid, terrified, that can even explain what you feel when you get into something like that, a place like that, and you spend a night here. There isn't any way to describe and to speak behalf of it. Probably to describe the Holocaust and what happened here, we need to invent a new language. Nothing, nothing from the words that exist that we have will not describe what happened here. יהיה רצון מלפניך, אדוני אלוהינו ואלוהי אבותינו, שיבנה בית המקדש במהרה בימינו ותן חלקנו מתורתך. When the boxcar door opened, I opened my own eyes. We entered the cold world of Auschwitz. Grandma didn't arrive with us on the train. She and Grandpa went to a place called Treblinka. Mama says they are happy, that it's good for them there. I don't understand why the men in green are yelling all the time. It frightens my little brother, Lazal. The men in green with the dogs take Papa to a different side, away from us. Papa waves and throws us a kiss. I love you, he calls out loud. It's stuffy in here. There's no air. And it's dark and scary. Thank God we can leave this place in a few days go back to Israel. The most significant moment was the feeling of relief I felt when I left. Constantly knowing that we were going to leave, that we would eat, shower, rest, and be warm, and understand that the only thing on my side is time. And while of course I'm grateful for my life, I'm not sure if it makes me feel better or worse knowing that timing saved me. Sarinka, 4 years old. Dora Zilberstein, 12 years old. Sarinka Lux, 6 years old. Lily, 7 years old. Franzek, 14 years old. Irena, 7 years old. Yitzhak Friedman, 5 years old. Baronik, 7 years old. David Klimberg, 5 years old. Hannah Kleinberg, 11 years old. Gisela, 5 years old. Yamin, Sina, David, Eliezer, Michael Kaplan. Alegra Tun, Daniela Tun, Eliawa Tun, Estera Tun, Fanny Atun, Ritka Tun, Sara, Rosa, and Victoria Tun. Sadiq Lave. Jacob Lave. Rivka Lave. Rafael Lave. Israel Bukhalta. 
בן ציון, בן שמואלי, פרידמן, אורי מיכאליס. יצחק ג'ורקוביץ', ארן הלה רבקה, שמואל סרה, ואבלה גודקוב. Many, many, many survivors that I spoke with said, we left the camp. We look normal, we have life, we have kids, we have grandkids, but the camp never left us. We dream about it at night. We dream about it during the day. Everything that we see around seems for us different. Even that we look normal. Remember this sentence. We left the camp, but the camp never left, never left us. We were just walking and we saw the amount of barracks that were destroyed. Like there was nothing left. We just knew they had been there. One day everything will be gone. When, when someone goes vi to visit this place, it will only be a reconstruction. There will be nothing left from the original. I went to Majdanek three times in my life. Every time was horrific, every time was surprising. You forget it. I think your, your brain wants to forget it, so you do. Like, there's things that you can't really forget, like you know that there's a pile of ash, so you know what's to come, but the feeling in the rooms, I feel like you really forget it very easily, and each time it's a shock. about that moment was how deeply we feel as like an um how deeply we feel our emotions and our connection um to the past and to our religion and to each other and how that has sustained us throughout thousands and thousands of years we played we laughed we were loved we had a future we were going to be lawyers rabbis wives teachers mothers we had dreams then we had no hope from the ashes. Hear our plea. This atrocity to mankind cannot happen again. Remember us, for we were the children whose dreams and lives were stolen away. This place, we could hear songs. We could hear Hebrew songs, Yiddish songs, Nigunim. Can't in any way bring back the life, unfortunately, the life that we have. There is one thing that we can do: it is to bring back a few moments, a few minutes, the spirit that was here. La 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 la. and we're still singing our songs and still being loud and still just showing that the Jewish people are we're more than a religion we're a community and I just find that so beautiful like it just makes me so happy to think about <laughs> I 
I'd say what we're seeing right now is an interesting mix between the old and the new Warsaw. Um, you know, the difference between what exists now and what existed back then. And it's really hard to fathom that our people were, I don't know, like stuck in this area and it's so beautiful and such amazing buildings. But when we see the remnants of what remained, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that uh, they lived in, in these conditions. And it's so cold, you know? 97% uh, of uh, the Warsaw Ghetto and 90% of Warsaw, the way it was, is not exist anymore. It was minus something, like f nine, I think, I can't remember. Um, and I tried to take off my jacket and like feel the cold. And I just remember it like really piercing through me. But we had the unfortunate privilege, privilege to be the ones to be chosen as Jews, to be exterminated completely, wiped out from earth, not just hatred between tribes, or, or, or a competition about space. It was ideology, deep ideology that those Jews must be raised from Earth to make the world better. And they made it total and universal, meaning any Jew anywhere in the world. And yes, the Holocaust was unique. I 100% I agree with that. But that doesn't mean that there are not other genocides going on and we can't leave those people like the rest of the world left us. Siegel Lubeskin was a leader of the Jewish organized underground in Poland and one of the founders of the Jewish fighting organization. In January 1943, the Germans launched a wave of deportations from the Warsaw Ghetto. In April 1943, when the actual final liquidation of the ghetto began, Lubeskin participated in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. She survived by escaping through the sewers to the Aryan side of Warsaw. During the summer of 1944, Sylvia also fought with the ZOB units that took part in the Warsaw Polish Uprising. After the war, she was active in the organization of Holocaust survivors and helped organize the Brisa, an organization that helped European Jews illegally immigrate to Palestine. Uh, we're in Warsaw. There used to be hundreds of synagogues in the city. However, now there's only one. And that's where we're going to be spending our Shabbat uh, this Friday night. In the synagogue, I found myself like really getting into the um, words of the prayers and every time I knew a song, I made sure to sing. It's just really amazing that I'm able to feel gratitude so deeply now. And you look at the Holocaust and... I mean, how are we different than the Jews that lived here? We're not. I'm very grateful to be in this time period where I was able to grow up religious and connected to my Judaism and safe. It was really impactful for me. It's been a very long time and I really value that time. the Egyptians, endured the Romans and Babylonians, and outlived those Nazis. We will outlive the people who want us destroyed even today. There is nothing we can't do, and nothing to bring us down. No sky too high, no sea too rough. And even when the sky is really high, and the sea is really fucking rough, we have each other. We will educate ourselves, we will hold ourselves accountable, and we will involve ourselves. All the souls of the six million Jews victims of the European Holocaust who were murdered, slaughtered, burnt, and exterminated by the German Nazi assassins and their helpers from the rest of the peoples.
Therefore, the Master of Mercy will protect them forever from behind the hiding of his wings and will tie their souls with the rope of life. The everlasting is their heritage. The Garden of Eden shall be their resting room, and they shall rest peacefully upon their lying place. They will stand for their fate at the end of, the, of days, and let us say, Amen. Amen. La Shalom. Amen. Kol an shamat el alia. Belgians in Treblinka. Pure death camps. A concentration, not labor, death camp. The Magen David of the flag, I felt protected. Not just physically, of course, from the cold, it was an extra layer. But very much emotionally and on a symbolic level. critical to come here. Even at the end, as we did now, even for a short time. Because now you know what was here, because you saw other places, but you also know what could have been in the other places if it, they weren't liberated. And you can also know what might be there in 50 years if someone will decide that that's it. I don't want it anymore. It's a monument for every Jewish community that died. As you can see, there's millions of stones. I don't even think we can possibly imagine how many people died here. 17,000 rocks are here, representing 17,000 more or less communities that were extinguished here. The Holocaust that befell the Jewish nation in the last era, during which millions of European Jews were sent to the slaughter, proved once again the necessity for a solution to the problem of the Jewish nation, devoid of independence and a homeland. The rebirth of the Jewish nation in Eretz Israel, which will open its doors wide to each and every Jew. I'm here in Treblinka and I'm honoring my great grandparents, Rachamim and Vida Baracha, and my great aunt, Rosa Baracha, who were killed here by the Nazis in April 1943. May their memory be a blessing. Yes, this part of the journey, our journey together, is over. But I'm not going in. I'm not here. Even if I will be far, I will be very close. I promise. As our journey concluded, we returned to Israel with a vow to live proudly in our uniqueness, our pride, our potential, and most importantly, our freedom. We will always know that our laughter, our music, our passion, our friendships, and our love for life is our way, and perhaps the only way, to avenge our people's losses. We all need to go to the people we care about and we admire and we think they transmit something good to us and tell them. My day, my week, probably my life, this is something I will never forget. If you need anything, if you need to talk, if you need someone to listen to you, seriously, you wake up from a nightmare and know how it feels, trust me, <laughs> be there, give me a call, whatever time you need. I love you. <laughs> I didn't expect to be surrounded by just amazing people. Everyone here thinks so beautifully. Like I love hearing people's thought processes and feeling everyone's like warm sparks of passion. And it's so special. And these are my favorite kind of conversations. 
I feel like I'm just a sponge to hear everything your friend has to say. I love it. There's not every day that you experience drama with a group of people, and they definitely build something special. And I definitely felt like even once I come back that some people are just become um, very, very crucial parts of my life. And I think that's amazing. And the people I don't get to see every day, I think about them and I miss them. Anytime I see someone from the trip on campus, we like immediately go into an embrace. And it is just so nice to feel like there's a community on campus that understands what you went through. Because I tried to explain it to my family, I tried to explain it to my friends, and nobody will really understand it the way like everyone who was on the trip will. Let's see.